Hello and good evening. I'm Akria Jamfi and welcome to the BAFTA television sessions, The Visual World of Small Acts, supported by TCL Mobile, who are for the second year supporting the TV sessions. We are so grateful for their continued support. This virtual series celebrates the nominees from this year's Virgin Media British Academy Television Awards and the British Academy Craft Awards. So before we get into it, here's some housekeeping before we start. Please join the conversation on socials using at BAFTA. If you have a question, please use the Q&A function if you're, if you're joining us on Zoom. If you're joining us on Facebook or YouTube, please you put your questions in the chat. Closed captioning is available now, which you can turn on at the bottom of your screen via the CC button. And before we get into it, let's remind us of the wonderful world of small acts. Amazing. That's brilliant. So um, first of all, I have to apologize. Unfortunately, Steve is, McQueen is unable to join us this evening. However, it's still going to be a wonderful conversation. Joining us tonight, we have Chris Diggins, the, edit the editor, Jacqueline Durren, costume design, Helen Scott, production design. Welcome, everybody. Hi. Hello. <clears throat> Hi. Hello, hello. Um, first of all, congratulations to you all as Small Axe picked up five wins at last night's BAFTA TV Craft Awards. Um, Helen directly um, for production design and Jacqueline for costume design. Um, and also Small Axe is also nominated for groundbreaking 15 uh, nominations at this Sunday's BAFTA General Awards. Um, what's it like being a part of this winning production, um, mm -hmm. especially if you as you reflect how impactful Small Axe has been overall? Um, I'll go to Helen first. Wow, um, what was it like? It, it was um, an amazing experience, obviously. Fantastic energy behind it with Steve. He's such a, he's such a, a you know, incredibly intelligent man and is a great sort of, sort of force. You know, he, he, he was, um, he just kind of really, was really sort of facilitated us all, I think you know, in a way that was very productive. You know, he gave us he, he gave us a kind of strong idea of what he was after, but then he let you kind of interpret that and bring things to the table yourself. So that's how it was really, you know, it was just exciting. It was exciting and it was satis it was rewarding and um, yeah, very gratifying to obviously had all this kind of attention as well as a result, you know, it was a great, it was great fun to do. Jacqueline. Hard work, hard work, but great. Jacqueline. Um, yeah, I think that there were two things. First of all was Steve is amazing and he really did, you know, bring the whole thing to life. But I also felt like a really, a big responsibility for telling the stories. Because it was in most cases, not Lovers Rock actually, but Sweetle's story and the other stories were, were personal stories. And, and there was a great obligation to really honor those stories and like bring kind of the be your best game to kind of representing them on camera. And, and Steve was just so, so inspiring and so such a great leader in, in us all together, bringing these stories to the, to the screen that he is, he, yeah, he's amazing. And Christopher, Chris, that's great, Christopher, um, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, well, I, again, yes, working with Steve was the main 
thing for me. I'd never worked with Steve before, but it, um, and he was, you know, and I, it got, it took a while to get to know him, obviously, and know, know how he works, but it was, because it was a long process for me. I mean, I'm sure it was for the others too, but it, I, I was doing this for nearly a year and a half. Mm, so it, it, and it was a, just an extraordinary year, you see, it's like it sort of co coincided with some in, incredible, like, world events. And I suppose I never realised quite what it would, how meaningful the series would end up being at the beginning. I just loved the material and I sort of was really, in, you know, I love working with Steve and getting getting to, you know, sort of into the, into the stories. And I just, it just sort of was like a sort of snowball really. And I, as last year sort of carried, you know, um, sort of finished, it sort of became bigger, you know, and, that, and I think that was the thing. It sort of took me by surprise in a way. Um, I always loved the stories and that was the, it went without saying, but it was just, it had more significance as we went on, as we worked on it more. I think, I mean, what the surprising impact, I, what, I, I don't know if I, I was surprised about the, 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 the response to it, even my own emotional response to the, um, to the series. And I think it's something personal that what I haven't seen and wanted to see for so long being visualized and that took my breath away in my reaction to this wonderful series. But there is a lack of information about the British Black experience and this is why it resonated so much. So for you guys to draw, where did you draw from to start your process with this narrative um, that hasn't been seen before? I'll start with um, Jacqueline. Well, I mean, I had the two specific episodes. So one was Lover's Rock and one was Alex Wheatle. And the process was slightly different because the, the, the films are different. You know, one is not somebody's personal story, but the story of one party on one night in a specific place. So there was a sort, there was a lot of research went into that in a specific way. And the Alex Wheatle story was based on his life, really. So the first thing, or one of the first things we did was went, we went and spoke to him and talked to him about, you know, the clothes he wore, the kind of environment he was in, um, the life he had, and he has an amazing memory. In fact, his memory is so great that I used some of the things he told me in Lovers Rock because mm. it was just he was he had the best memory of of fashion in those specific years. Lovers Rock was interesting because it's it's a it's a strange thing because the late seventies style has been reused again and again and again, and so has lots of style related to sound systems and everything. It's quite familiar, well, relatively familiar. And we kept going, we went through and through just tons of photographic reference from sound systems and just general photography of that date. And in there, we found just very few pictures of women in the specific style of dresses that we ended up using that, that we just chose to be the way we were going to represent that party on that date. And, and it isn't that that is the way that everybody dressed at that particular time, but it is one way. And it's a way that hasn't been reinterpreted and reused and regurgitated in fashion quite as much as all the other looks. So it felt fresher and it felt new. And it, it, was, a, it was just a way for us to, to tell that story in a kind of slightly different way. And, and that was really photographic reference. There's just so much brilliant photography from that period. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And um, Helen with the production design, it's actually, I read that you said you grew up during this time. So what, <laughs> well, what yeah, I mean, is that, is that kind of a mis that, That's about right. I mean, I do, I do, I do remember those parties, um, but I, I was just, just to, um, something Jacqueline's just said, you know, that sort of seeing those, seeing those um, people wearing those clothes, it was so refreshing to see that and quite captivating and you know, very, very, um, unusual to see that on screen and that whole film so unusual you know to have that kind of um time de devoted to it on on mainstream television you know just kind of never seen it before at all and i think it, i think that's what has kind of caught people's imagination really or caught you know caught the attention of people it's just that it's very unusual um, sorry, what was your question? <laughs> and do you know what? I was trying to think, what did I ask? <laughs> Actually, it was, I think jumping off from what Jacqueline said about memory and having Alex's wonderful memory to aid the visual. Yes. You were drawing from experience of being, maybe having seen those parts. What else, what else pulls you in to get 
Starts yeah, to yeah. I mean, I did, I did recognize aspects of what I was, you know, what I was trying to portray. And there's a load to learn because there was a lot I didn't know at all. And you know, for me, it was the excitement was working with Steve McQueen and the stories, and you know, the, this kind of opportunity to design for those periods as well. Um, the research side is is everything, you know. There's, but there is, like Jacqueline says, a lot a lot of research to to be found archives talking to people photographs videos you know all the, there's lots um and in the end you have to kind of filter it really and draw from it the, the elements that interest you or that you think speak to the stories we're trying to tell and sort of um yeah gel gel them together somehow so it's a sort of hybrid really what you end up with is a hybrid of all the things you've seen all the things you've learned all the things you remember there was some, I suppose Lover's Rock I remember more and also actually education was one I felt quite um, uh, connected to because I went to school about the time of the story you know I was about the same age as that character so I kind of knew what the school was like so so yeah it's kind of drawing on my own memories as well. And Chris you said there was a surprise to the reaction but, and so does that come from a space of not necessarily knowing this world, but also then you've got to emotionally connect with this and stitch this mm. epic, yeah. <laughs> epic scenarios together in a way that <laughs> is authentic and true. That's a big feat for something that you might not necessarily know. So what was your, what was your, what was the thing that made it click for you and that yeah. you this, is it, this is how I'm going to do it? Well, I mean, like, like Helen and I mean, I, I lived through, lived through a lot of, apart from mangrove, which was before I was was only just born then, so I I remember I remember the Brixton riots, I remember the Birmingham riots, I remember, you know, like parties like Lovers Rock, Sound Systems, going to Notting Hill Carn Carnival, things like that. But from a different point of view, which is the really crucial thing about it, and so I, this was like another country for me. This is what I I saw was like, oh, is this the same place that I've lived in for the last 40, 40 years or 40, 50 years or something? And of course, that was the that was the sort of path that I went. And so Steve and I had lots of conversations about music, what sort of music I was into. And I was sort of into punk rock and things like that, which actually had quite a lot of um, not similarities in, in the music, but in the attitude of reggae and reggae and punk had a big had a kind of like a fusion and it was happening in Notting Hill and that and so you know Steve and I talked about that type of thing um you know what we're into but also what filmmakers from that time and so that was a sort of journey you know we apart from you know exploring the kind of like the music which I, I mean going back to the music that was a massive part of the films I mean, particularly Alex Wheatle, Lovers Rock, and even Mangrove is like sort of it gave it an identity, and we did a lot of work on it like that is, and it sort of helped to give it life, you, you know, and so that was a, that was a big key for me, and like and particularly in Lovers Rock's rediscovering that music, which is I I knew some of it, but like I, I didn't know a lot of the, the rest of it, and so discovering all that again was just like for me was just something incredible and and of course at a party like that i i never realized that they had the djs had one deck not two which is a really crucial thing because like i'm like we go to a, a club and there's two decks and they mix them and it's seamless but these guys don't do that they stop the record put sound effects on and then put another one on really quickly and it, it's really bizarre but it actually creates a really unique sound and in terms of the edit, it gave us a lot more stuff to play with, sound effects, this kind of stuff, you know. And so, it, so it, it was a slowly we got more and more immersed in that world. Um, and what was I saying? Yeah, the, and and about filmmakers and about the essentially, all the stories were different, but they had a kind of very a sort of tr truth about them in terms of their the way they were shot. You know, there was not no frills really. Essentially, it was and in a way that we we did a i love like alan clark who was like sort of did a lot of movies in the eight, 70s 80s and that steve was one of our references of movies that tv films and things that he made which you know like made in britain and things like that you know which were really kind of straightforward sort of storytelling but like full of life 
and and that was kind of the how the whole thing began that was what i had in my head and um yeah and then again i lived through the period so i had a lot of refer personal references but just from a different point of view um thank you jacqueline uh, what you said that is you know you've got to try and find an angle that's not been seen before so you know we've seen the 70s visualized in so many different ways it, it's not so much that you don't want to use something that's been seen before in a way but what happens a lot with 70s clothes is that we reuse them so so we keep making them fashionable again so there's like a 90s way of wearing the 70s and there's a 2000s way right. and it means that it doesn't like it kind of takes away from something that you feel about the period so in order to get to the period you want to find things that haven't been like overused and also, you just want to make sure that people wear the clothes. If you do find like the original piece that's exactly the right thing, you then have to be sure that you wear it in the way it was worn then, not the way we would wear it now if we reappropriate it. So it was about that. It was trying to get back to something that would feel, it wouldn't feel kind of tired or too familiar. I mean, it would feel like something that was definitely part of the period. So it was that really. But anyway, sorry, I interrupted you. No, no, but that's fine. That's, <laughs> that, that's good. No, that's good because it was, it, was, it, it was, I had kind of misinterpreted what you're saying yeah. and that's a real clear um, explanation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it also then how do you not let the characters become caricatures of this time and of this moment? and pulling the authenticity that was it a, was it a struggle or was this any was this a different project than anything you've done before was there anything you learned new or had to kind of like i'm not experienced i'm starting fresh in this at this yeah. point so that was actually my main thing that that was the main thing that i when I, when i spoke to steve and when i realized that i was going to do the job and i really wanted to do it like in the to the very best that i could and what I, what I wanted to do is I really wanted to get something, I wanted to get the sort of an authentic diversity into it in the sense that I didn't want it to, I didn't want it to pick up the same old things that people pick up again and again, that they say signify that period or, or that kind of person. And I wanted to look more closely and in greater detail at the reference. And I wanted to really try and get back to something that was more authentic. And so in that sense, that's why that ties into what I just said about not wanting to kind of use things that are a bit tired because they get used over and over again. And I wanted to get back to the source material and kind of screw with it. And then when you're doing that, you get, you can kind of find different things about that you can give to different characters. And, and then it's, all, it's also about a balance, just like everything else is, so that you want, you know, the way you dress your principal characters is slightly different to ways you may dress the crowd just because you want them to be more noticeable. But one of the amazing things I think about Lovers Rock, which speaks to every, all of us in all the departments and, and obviously largely to Steve and Chabier is the fact that Lovers Rock just didn't really have principal actors. It did have principal actors, obviously it had the protagonist, but, it, but the, the context and the crowd and everybody in the scenes was equally as important. And so there wasn't that sort of um, difference between the crowd and the principals. It really was a party. And I've never really experienced that before. I mean, you can't quite tell when you're watching it who is an actor and who isn't. I mean, Steve gets the such amazing performances from the supporting artists. It's unbelievable. And so in that sense, what I've just said is, is only partly true, but it also is about creating that the look of our party and and there is something that because it was largely a joyful experience watching the party it was it was really important to um to try to, to stylize it a bit without compromising what we wanted to do in terms of authenticity but just to tweak it so that it became something beautiful and, and Steve has mentioned before that slightly fairy tale and magical, but something almost like it, it was how you wanted to remember parties were. You know, there was something really kind of special about it. So in that sense, it's slightly heightened, I would say. Definitely. Um, I could go on about that. <laughs> but it was, um, I don't feel like I'd hog it, but they're just to say that it was a moment that from beginning to end, I had memories and it was very 
you know, very relatable. And I think it, it really worked. And a couple of those dresses, I would like, please. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, Helen, can you talk about how difficult or easy it was to find locations? And again, bring it into this authenticity, because I think there's something about something set in London, especially when you're from London and West London. I live in West London. So you're always looking for those signifiers. They're like, I recognize that spot. And even if maybe sometimes you can't because the location can't be, you know, you can't get it for whatever reason. How was that an issue that you wanted people to really recognize it or did you just want to create this essence of the time and the space and was it difficult at all in any way? Uh, yeah, it, it was It was difficult. It was, um, it was complicated we, because I really had a sort of um, a notion, I suppose, that we would um, be able to set each story in a separate part of in a different part of London and um, the, so in order to give it its own flavor and its own um, architecture um, but we there was no you know it quickly became apparent that was never going to happen because you just can't find everything well, for you can't find everything you're looking for in one area anyway um, but but then like with Notting Hill we we decided to remove it slightly from Notting Hill. Um, we, we wanted to kind of shoot it around Kilburn. Um, so it has sort of had a feel of Notting Hill, but then it, we needed to find All Saints Road and that was difficult. Um, and we also had to um, shoot parts of it in, um, well, all over London, really. I mean, it, every location, was compromised in one way or another. It, you know, it sort of came to a full, it came to a dead end. The location would come to a dead end and you couldn't move any further. So you'd have to stitch it together with another location somewhere else in another part of London. And that was, that was very um, frustrating really. You know, we couldn't kind of get. Could I, could I ask what the compromises were and why something would come to a dead end when it comes to location? And this is me coming very like, I don't know what the hell. <laughs> well, for example, in um, in the opening sequence to the Mangrove story, um, where we had Frank Critchlow in um, gambling, in a gambling den, and then he comes up some steps and that he goes, you know, we, we really wanted the, the West Way to feel like a kind of a co community divide, you know, for it to be symbolic of London, Re being redeveloped you know after the war and how that was splitting the community the west way was um you know not helping anybody in you know who lived in that area help the people trying to go jump it you know but <laughs> not the people living there so but but that whole sequence I, I can't remember how many locations we used but it was probably 10 to get him to the mangrove restaurant we we it was stitching together several different components and part of part of that was not that we wanted to make a literal journey from a to b but but because each you know moment of that journey has to tell part of the story um but it, it you know would have been fantastic to find it all in a more natural organic way but we we couldn't do that you know we 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 were you know i can't remember where it was exactly but you know way outside the m25 to the north wow. um you know deptford Kilburn, I can't remember, but you know, but it, there were a lot of locations. And so that's complicated. It's time consuming. There's lots of travel. There's lots of kind of frustration because you just want it to be a bit more seamless. So that's the, that's the kind of difficulty we were up, up against is because you just cannot find those sort of locations in their original condition anymore. You know, yeah. you have a kind of, you know, aspiration that you will but it just never seems to happen that way well done for those 10 locations and <laughs> i may have exaggerated but i don't think i have but i mean then i suppose chris are helen's problems your problems when it comes to stitching it all together and editing it um, um what 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 i how does that refer, how is the, how does that well, no it wasn't because because okay. because you did a good job a good job of it so <laughs> I mean, those locations around, I know them, All Saints Road, I go down there every day. I go down there and then somebody the other day said, hang on, that's not Notting, that's not Notting Hill, that's, that's around the corner from us, isn't it? And I said, oh yeah, okay, but it doesn't matter. And it, it's, the, the whole point is actually, it, it's, 
it worked and there was never any problem with that never i mean okay. you know it's getting that to work particularly in the mangrove actually although i you know i knew it but it it was and and part part of that was the way way it was shot because it was you know actually there was only really one big y one or two big wide shots at the beginning of like the the west way which we created as, as a visual effects thing and then we went under it and then after that we were like right in there pretty much for the entire film um you know there weren't really like big wide establishing shots we were there within the crowd or in the riot or in that in within those kind of places in the courtroom there, there wasn't really a wide establish of the courtroom not a class a traditional one um we tried it a bit we tried to even to find a library shot and things we could like stitch that together with something else and it just didn't work with the language of the film because again this was another view of this society that we're seeing from the inside so um you know the locations became not that they didn't matter but it was you weren't looking at that you were looking at the people in amongst it i'd love to know about you your your, your all, all of your relationships with steve as his, in his role as writer director and creator and and in parallel with your in with your roles on on, on the project um chris i uh steve was in the editing room as well so what was that yeah. like and what was how did you balance that act and um, general, what's your relationship between steve and his role and yours as editor? well i mean you know like i mean it's difficult to say like classic director editor relationship most of the time i mean it, it's how did it work i mean it was whilst we were filming i mean steve came in every day he could and we worked on he, he likes to just get straight in there and and get to the finished sequence that works. And a lot of those sequences didn't change that much right from the beginning. But he he kind of wants you to think of your own idea. He, he's not he's he wants you to lead. He he was he sort of wanted me to lead with it and present something to him, rather than him having to say, oh, this is what I wanted to do and this was my vision of it and all that. He didn't really talk about that. He wanted to let me just make, just cut cut it. And I, I started the series late. So I, I started editing uh, Mangrove whilst, whilst they were filming Lover's Rock. So I was doing both at the same time. And so I, I, I did, I sort of did as much as I could of Mangrove. And then I felt it was getting a bit heavy uh, the story, so I just went and jumped to Lover's Rock as it was as it was filming, and so I sort of had an antidote and to that. And then, of course, every time Steve came in, he wanted to see um, Lover's Rock. He didn't want to see Mangrove, or, but you know, because Lover's Rock was his kind of like, um, what's the word? I think he sees saw it as the sort of jewel of the series in a way right from earlier, kind of slightly experimental. But um, but in terms of our relationship, I mean, you know, it was more, um, yeah, it went was for a very long time. And then at a certain point, we, he, we were in different countries because of the whole lockdown and stuff. So I was working in London, he was in, in Holland, we, we had to come back from Holland. So we, I mean, how, how can I describe it? It's Steve's very, he's, he's got, he's not like any other director I've worked with. He's really unique. And he, what the, the main thing the main thing that we that he sort of had to educate me as to what he his kind of language you know the way he works and and i found i cut things a little tight little shorts particularly lovers rock and there's a couple of sequences in there that that you know i just thought okay silly games is three and a half minutes long song they did a bit of improv so i made it a little longer and i thought that felt about right and Steve came in, came to watch it. He says, not long enough. So he's, the, the process was about making it longer. I said, well, how much longer? I said, I'll, I'll have another go, I said, and I'll make it longer. So I sort of doubled it in length. And Steve said, no, it still doesn't feel right. I want to put, put more in. I said, well, how much? He said, well, everything. Basically, we used almost everything that they shot. And, and in that particular sequence, there were three takes, maybe four that they just ran the camera. And this is like going, going back to what Jacqueline said about he got great performances out of the, you know, supporting artists, but also it looked beautiful. 
I mean, in, in every way, the costumes, the design, the photography, what you name it, it looked beautiful. So that allowed us to hold on to hold shots. And this is what, particularly with that film, I mean, they they all have a different way, a diff, had a different approach in terms of the editing. And we could talk for probably days about that. We, the like Lover's Rock is quite specific in that, in holding, and that wasn't the only sequence, like the Kunta Kinte dub sequence at the end, which is like, they did three times and we used it every one. They went back and replayed the song, which is just no one. And most people would never do that except Steve. And of course, what you do is you're, you're then starting to build up a reality of it, like, like almost like a home video or something. And that, and that, and in, and in most of Steve's films, he has shots that are held for like in hunger, there's one that holds for 10 minutes or something. And it's like, this. it's a kind of not so much a signature thing. It's, it's something that he, he he just ends up doing is that he he just whatever that he gets a, it gets you to sort of fall behind that sort of vision you know and yeah, so that was it make it longer make the whole thing longer and, then, and therefore the whole experience was was slightly i think as a film is slightly different um and um and it and it and more real re, it's felt real felt like you were there Absolutely. I, I was actually going to ask you about that scene and you explained it beautifully. Sorry. No, 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 it's fine. It was a perfectly, perfectly seamless editor. It was seamless. Um, it was, a, it, yeah, because that, that was a very powerful scene and very emotive. And when the crowd, the audience that I watched it with, we, we were there. I, that's why it's something about Lover's Rock, it there every step of the way, every set, every moment. And that particular scene, yeah. it dr dragged you in. You couldn't ignore it. And you were there really, really in the moment. They went crazy, those guys. They went absolutely mad. And there, there's hardly any, I mean, Steve just said, oh, they just did it. They, they just did it. I said, I don't, I don't believe that. It's never happened before. So. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I think it's got something to do with Steve himself. Yeah. And I have heard that that place they shot that's around the corner from me, that that's condemned now or something, isn't it? That really? Yeah, that's it's very likely. <laughs> wow. There was falling down while we were using it. You realise that? There was oh, part God. of the house we couldn't go into. Oh, wow. Um, and yeah, there were kind of props holding up the floor in the room next door. Miracle. Yeah. <laughs> No, that was a great location, actually, because that was the opposite of the mangrove in the sense that it gave us everything we needed. Yeah. In one sort of bubble. It was fantastic because we got all the angles that were scripted, the relationship between the stairs, the party, the entrance, the kitchen. It was all just kind of laid out before our eyes, really. So the shape of it was there. I just had to make it look right. <laughs> and, 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 very good location. And then your relationship with um, Steve in your role as, um, you know, production and design, mm -hmm. sorry, and Steve as direction writer, what, what's your conversation? What are your conversations? What happens between the two of you? Well, it's kind of similar, really, in that I, I, Steve really surprised me because, you know, and every director is different, but he, he was so, he really put his trust in me. And I think with all other HODs and beyond, you know, I think he, really um, was very happy to embrace what each person could bring. And it took me a while to get used to that, to be honest. I, I kind of was a bit um, shy of it. I thought, well, you know, you kind of think, well, surely, I mean, I'd refer to him quite often. I'd say, you know, what do you, what do you think? And he'd, he'd say, well, you tell me, you're the, design, you're the designer. <laughs> and um, that was kind of a bit scary until I kind of got to know him a bit better, but also very, very liberating and empowering, you know, and, and um, just unusual. And that was really, that kind of leaves you at the end feeling like you really have made a very personal contribution to the project um, mm -hmm. in, a way that, in a way that you don't often get to experience. It was, it was really, you know, not just retrospectively, but also at the time, it was it was really, really energizing. I enjoyed it. Um, Jacqueline, and your relationship with Steve, what were some of your conversations um, and where you left your own devices? It, I don't know. I, I wouldn't really describe it as being left to my own devices. I'd, I'd say that it's sort of like you you propose something and he counter proposes and then you kind of move on and you kind of feed off of each other's ideas and you say and you arrive somewhere at something that 
that's going to be right for the film. But but it's very much that he 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 wants contributions from people, and it's not. I I don't think it's really because he, you know, he has his own vision, but he he wants to get, and I think it's part of how you create something that's true is you get more than one point of view and you work with different points of view and then you end up with something that's richer for the for that so i think very much that that's how it works is that you you all everybody not it's not limited to us three heads of department it's it's thinking like hearing people's mm. people's ideas and things and putting them and kind of filtering them and manipulating them so that you end up with the the thing that you want but that's that's built out of many points of view mm. i mean that's how i viewed it and i think that's how i still view it in a way is that that it's lots of people's contributions that are honed mm. down by steve and made into something so mm. i suppose that's how i view it mm. that, uh that's true. We, we even used some of the research material in the edit. We went back and looked at all the stills that have been used yeah. and all that. Look, we didn't look at costumes, but I, it really helped me because I, I, then I, it was like I saw the research that other, other people mm -hmm. had done, photographic references, things like that. It really helps you like, understand how you're going like, to put the thing together. Mm -hmm. I think there's also something very fluid about Steve. You know, he, he, he's, he's got a very strong vision, but he's also very happy to change, not happy, but he will change his mind, you know, as well. He's not frightened to do that. Um, so it, he's not rigid. Mm. Um, and it's like, you know, because, because he does um, listen to people and he does consider what they're saying, he will, you know, quite often shift, shift a bit. And, and you know, that's great. Yeah, and let things go. He, he sort yeah. of doesn't fuss with things, particularly in the edit, like there's some we did fuss with some areas, but others, first cut of it, or you know, worked on it, and that was it. Mm. It's, no, that's it. That's how. And doesn't he, he like let, letting things breathe, basically, creatively? I think. Yeah. Okay. And, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Yes, no. oh, please finish. I was, I was just going to say when we were actually shooting some scenes as well, that he would just sort of quite radically change how he shot them. You know, from what was planned. Um, and make them very succinct as well. He was very, you know, he's very good at kind of cutting through to the point of the scene and sort of getting rid of all the peripheral distractions. I was going to say how, because this is such a personal story, um, it's an important story and it's an, it, there was, there would have been a, there was a huge expectation for the awaiting audience, especially the British black community that wanting this narrative. What did you have any, um, were you nervous about how it would be received in your yeah. work? <laughs> <laughs> speak on it, Jacqueline, speak on it. <laughs> yeah, I was nervous. And it comes back to the, to the fact that um, it's not my story, but, but I want to use the skills that I've accumulated over my career to help Steve tell this story. So I want to, I want to honor it. Um, and I want to do the best that I can. But yes, I was really nervous and, and, I, and it really, really meant a lot to me that I would be able to represent people in the way that felt authentic to the people that knew, you know, whose first-hand experience it was. Um, so I called on a lot of people to, to look at things, to tell me their point of view. I, I asked all the actors to ask their parents. I, I was conscious all the time of trying to nail it into the community. And, and I was very, uh, yeah, I was very apprehensive about it. And I, yeah, that was really one of my main things that I wanted to do. And it, it was the thing that kind of, not that I wouldn't be pushed anyway to keep looking at more and more reference to try and nail the detail, to try and avoid the cliche, all these things. But I would, it, that was also the motivator is that I just wanted to get to a place where we managed to create a look that was more authentic than you often see. Not that not it's not that you never see it, but it's very rare. And to expand on the question, then, do you did you guys ever feel because compare compare comparing this project to any of your previous projects, because it is a Black British story, was that the 
the weight, the pressure. Um, and yeah, I don't know, maybe I'm asking the same thing, but just was that specifically the weight and pressure of it, of getting it right? Or is that, is that have you felt that pressure before in other projects? Helen? Well, oh. yeah, it, hmm. it, it is a pressure you feel on all projects, but I, but yes, I think, you know, if it isn't, if it isn't your world exactly, if you, if you know, it, you might have touched it, you know, within some other context, like all, you know, lived in a parallel kind of way. Um, yeah, it, it, you, you just have to kind of really under, try and understand it and try and try and, you know, absorb as much true authentic information as you can and do do the research and listen and watch and and just do just do the best you can understand it the best you can and convey it you know yeah yeah it's, it's the pressure chris i i i felt nervous in a way only that again because of you know i yeah they're not my personal stories but i just basically steve was my kind of what test of what was right or wrong essentially because a lot of these stories were things he experienced like education and then he sort of talked you know the father in red white and blue he sort of steve would talk about his own father and all that and i you know you 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 still have and i could talk about mine <laughs> You know, and you still have all that in common, despite, you know, the fact that it's not my story. And, and essentially what my my thing is just to to concentrate on the story and telling that the, the best way I, I possibly can with Steve, you know, and, it, and that does it justice, essentially, is to get it to work, essentially. And then and then, you know, I did feel nervous, but not as we as we went on, because we 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 were getting such good feedback you know and the actors started seeing it for do, doing their adr and stuff and they were like loving it you know you start to have faith in it and it, it's like often like that on a production you don't you never know you don't know if it's good or bad right at the beginning it's just the weight of opinion as you as you as you're doing it and you're having successive screenings with people and i mean by the way steve we we would he he doesn't he has sort of final cut of the piece so even if there are different opinions that in the end he's the one that makes the decision you know and so we had a lot of notes from bbc and people like that who loved it said they loved it gave us notes but we didn't necessarily do their notes we we made the film that steve wanted to make and i think that's that's important too because it's quite it's distinctively a steve mcqueen as well isn't it and that and that gets you through it as well it's it's the stories are true stories and they are authentic but it's steve's steve's version of them mm -hmm. and so um yeah um we've got a question from the audience and please guys keep them coming um it's a question for jacqueline uh the person says i'd love to know more about your costume team did you bring on specific people for your programs or was there an existing team for the whole series i really loved your approach and congratulations on the bafta uh, Sally, a costume trainee. So the series, I was the person that was approached by Steve first to do the whole series, but I, I wasn't able to do the whole series. So I had two co-designers on the series, Lisa Duncan and Sinead Kidal, and we each did two episodes each. And in a nominal way, I was overseeing the whole thing, but I didn't really do any overseeing because they were perfectly capable of doing their episodes themselves. And so, um, so that was one way is that only part of the series is my take on this period and two other people are involved. Um, what was the other part of the question? Sorry, I forgot. Uh, I think the team. And then obviously I, each person, so, so Lisa Duncan had her own specific team which were completely separate to my team. And my team and Sinead's team were more overlapping so that some people Mark Lord, for instance, did all of the crowd costumes for four episodes. So it was it was much more mixed uh, in between our four episodes. But otherwise we had, yeah, yeah, it's just a team working on it. I'm guessing that as Sally is a costume trainee, she might be thinking, hey Jacqueline, <laughs> how, do I, how do I get in touch? <laughs> sure. Is there, sure. Is there a route to Jacqueline? Um, yeah, there we go. Uh, a question for Chris. Did you feel like you were 
cutting different films or was there a sense that you were editing a continuous story, narrative work? Um, no, definitely cutting different films because they, they had every one of them even was shot on a different format. One was shot on 16 millimeter, another, you know, everything. So they all felt like different films. And and because therefore we approached them differently, like in Mangrove, for instance, was particularly two is a film in two parts, which actually was written as two episodes of a, what originally was a TV series. But Steve said. Everybody's frozen. I know. I'm, I, am I? Uh, you go, okay. <laughs> we were so drastically still, I wasn't sure, but Chris is <laughs> um, Hopefully he'll be back soon. I might move on to the next question. Um, there's a question for Helen. Congratulations to all, in particular for Lovers Rock, which was such a creative triumph. What was the most challenging of the five stories to design? And that's Julian Alcantara. Hello, Julian. Hello, Julian. Um, what was the most challenging? It's really hard to single <laughs> single anything out. I mean, they all had their challenges um, and they were kind of similar challenges, really. I suppose Lover's Rock kind of sat more comfortably because it was, you know, like I said earlier, it was its kind of finite thing and we, did, we weren't all over the place. So it wasn't so logistically difficult. Um, I, I think, I suppose in general, the difficulty was was finding locations. Once we'd found the locations, it sort of ran more smoothly. Um, I can't think that one was more difficult than another. When we, we had to, we did actually move, we relocated to the West Midlands for the, for the last two episodes of the, of the shoot, not, not the last two that were transmitted. Um, and that was that kind of gave us a boost of fresh air, really, because it meant that we could, um, you know, give those episodes a different look, different, give them a different atmosphere. Um, I think we we might have struggled to do those in London. I think we were kind of running out of steam a bit in London and and location choices. So it was, you know, um, it was very helpful to make that move. Um, yeah, I can't really think of any other way of answering the question. Uh, Jacqueline, were there any, any difficulties for you at all? Um, yeah, loads of difficulties. <laughs> but uh, there was one difficulty that was, which, which was sort of built in, which was trying to tell Alex Weasel's story, which covered so many years in such a short amount of time. So you didn't you didn't want to be in the situation where he was constantly changing costumes and things seemed to be rushing through but at the same time you were conscious that you had to show the passage of time and at the same time you had things which everybody knows the dates for like the uprising and everything else which gives you a pinpoint and you know that if he was born then you know that so much time has passed so that was quite a difficult thing it, it involved making some choices to sort of reduce the, the number of changes, but it doesn't really work when you actually see how much time has passed. So I had problems like that. And just problems of time, you know, it was because the thing was structured to be a TV series, it means that you, where you would normally roll on half of your characters from one episode to the next, we were all doing, we were doing five different films with different crews. So the people don't overlap. The, the thing you've set up in the last episode doesn't help you in the next. So it was a lot to do, you know, Lover's Rock, I mean, was it's such a short amount of time as well. We shot Lover's Rock in 10 days. So it's tiny and quick. So but by the time you've shot Lover's Rock, you're already on to the next one. So that was quite a lot. I can imagine. Um, a question, <laughs> question for both of you. Um, I'm interested in the use of pattern in costume and wallpaper design in, in the use of pattern in costume and wallpaper design in Lover's Rock and what was available to a community as opposed to what they what may have been available to the mainstream. Was it authentic design? Did you use references from photographic evidence? And this is in reference to Lover's Rock um, for both of you. Welcome back, Chris. Hi, sorry, don't know what happened there. We'll, we'll come back to you in a second. <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> um, yeah, Helen or Jacqueline, you can go first. I don't mind, do you wanna go, Helen? No, you can go. <laughs> <laughs> <I don't mind. laughs> um, Yes, there's lots of uh, there's lots of things in that really. 
Yes, I did use actual um, reference. Uh, and, I, and the main pattern in the costume is the men's shirts. And not all of the men have, have that particular type of pattern shirt, but it was a thing. And we chose to use it on a section of the actors and the supporting artists. So that was one thing. We also used very minimal pattern on in the women's dresses. There were only a couple that had any pattern at all. It was mainly blocks of color, which was just about um, just the way that it looked really. And I, from something I said earlier, it's, it's about, it is a stylized view. So even though we did take all of the reference, as Helen said, you kind of, you filter the reference to end up with the look that you want. So Lover's Rock was certainly a filtered look and, and kind of heightened and stylized. Um, so all of those, all of the looks that were there were correct, but whether they, whether that was the exactly how it would have appeared, I mean, it could have, there's no reason not, but it, I would say it was heightened, but not much pattern. Okay. Helen, was there anything else? To yeah, well, I, I do enjoy using pattern. Um, and I, you know, in the mangrove, I chose pattern specifically because it was contrasty. You know, I wanted, I wanted the, because it's a very sort of graphic story. We talked about the, um, the written word and the written message and the graffiti. And so this kind of idea of black and white, you know, ink on paper kind of theme came up for that film and so that's what I was trying to do with the patterns as well to keep a kind of very controlled color palette and but make the patterns really bold so that's what I was trying to do there and then in Lover's Rock um, again a big pattern wallpaper and that was because I wanted the people to be slightly dwarfed in that house I wanted the house to be big and I wanted them to kind of bounce around inside it as if they were in a speaker box and the whole I wanted the whole house to feel like it could vibrate and so the paper kind of helped that so to give it sort of a grainy texture um, and yeah the scale of it was was kind of deliberate to um, to make the space feel larger as well. Um, so coming back to Chris you were saying about how, 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 how it felt what it felt like stitching where you, you felt like you were you had, they were individual films. That's right. I want to ask the relationship between all of you. So when you're editing and you say, oh my God, that color clashes with that dress. I can't, I can't edit this anymore. I've got to stop. What's your relationship with, between the three of you um, when, in bringing this piece together? And from an editor's perspective and then the rest of you. Um, you mean bet us three? Yeah, it's, it's a relationship. It's a conversation that you guys have. Could Not you stop pattern clashing and say no? Oh no. It's done by then. <laughs> Oh, it's yeah. Oh, Chris, come back. Okay. All right. There's a. Oh. I was. Go on. Go on. Was, yeah, I would say there's definitely a conversation be between costume designer and production designer, and that's that's ongoing. We're always talking and, um, you know, collaborating and comparing and checking in with colors and, um, and exactly, you know, pattern block color. We we talk about that a lot. Um. So. If it clashes on the day, it's because we meant it to. <laughs> and it's the seventies; things are supposed to clash. I, yeah. <laughs> um, then the question, another question from the audience: Rebuilding teams. Um, was it important for the teams you're all working with to be representative of the community portrayed? Aside from Steve himself, was there a conscious effort to have Black British talent working behind the scenes as well as on screen? Which there's been a big conversation about crew and representation behind the screen. Um, how did you adapt to this? Was it pressure to find um, representative talent? And have you worked in the past and how things change going forward? Um, Jacqueline first. Yes, there was, there was definitely, we put as much, we put a great effort into getting as diverse a crew as possible and it isn't easy because historically not an, the the number of people coming into film from diverse backgrounds has been very low so so the number of people with experience is is low still and that's something that we need to change and small acts was a great job in that sense for giving people an opportunity to 
to come and get some experience and to get their first kind of foot into the industry in costume at least and and as I said there was the crews varied and so we had a sort of movable group of people but that was definitely a hundred percent what we were aiming to do and and I you know I, I still find it really difficult to um to recruit people from diverse backgrounds I haven't found that many there's a lot of initiative starting but still it's taking a long time for people to come to get through the institutions and get onto the floor in film and tv so i i just welcome every every initiative to to, to make that more to make that passage simpler and to get more and more people coming to work in the industry because in films that i've worked on since it's it's been very hard to find people um, Helen, I would imagine the same for production design. Absolutely the same. Yeah, we we were wholeheartedly um, doing our doing everything we could, you know, to to recruit from diverse backgrounds. But um, also, um, I wanted it, you know, for the reason, you know, for the reasons of good good production design as well, you know, to and to have that kind of to have a um, direct connection or link, you know, with people from that community who could authenticate the things we were doing um, and who could also give you know help with sort of, um, background research as well you know direct research which was really really helpful and direct experience yeah I, I, I think um, there, there are lots there are lots of conversations happening and I think it's great to know that their efforts are being made and how but it's also how to continue these efforts and not mm just be limited to this is a black story so let's get mm. a representative crew in this story it has to be across the board so that everyone can be exposed to different conversations i think the richer the the, the diversity of behind the scenes brings a richer story i think yeah. in collaboration and bringing it to life because we mm. all like i think what you guys did was bring your perspective to a story that was authentic to steve and mm. the other people of color in the room but your perspective of being there, especially, you know, Helen, you said you had, you've been to a blues, you've been to a dance. So what was that, you know, bringing that to that story enhances it, I think, mm -hmm. I think it's important. Um, I think we're done. I think time's up and it's a shame Chris couldn't. Yeah, we didn't get him back. Couldn't get him back, but I must say, well, first of all, congratulations to you both. Um, thank well you. Done, after win, and thank you for a wonderful contribution to a wonderful piece of work. Um, so I'd like to thank Helen and thank Jacqueline for your time. Thank you to the audience. Thank you to Chris and to Steve who couldn't be with us, unfortunately. And many thanks to our TCL for their continued support for our sponsors, TCL. And um, the next event in this series is an Instagram live within Kuti Katwa and Amy Lou Wood on Thursday, 27th of May, 5.45 p.m. UK time. My name is Akhlia Jamfi, founder of The British Blacklist, and it's been wonderful to be with you all tonight. Thank you so much and good night. Thank you. Thank you.